Hey everybody, I wanted to make a video uh, presentation, kind of lecture presentation uh, over these concepts from our book. So groups, teams, conflict management, the book separates them a little bit more. I'm gonna show you how we pull them together. So with this, we need to go back and review, kind of remember uh, the different levels of analysis of organizational behavior. So the individual down at, down at the core, uh, personality, those those types of things. Uh, groups, this is what we're going to study in this one, and then groups make up organizations, and then all of that exists within an environment. So organizational behavior people are ones who recognize that all of those levels kind of exist simultaneously, and that each one is unique, and we need to understand it, but then also we need to understand how it relates to the ones above and below it. So that systems approach. So with this, this, this has a, a lot of material in it, and if we were doing in-person classes, this would probably be a week and a half or even two weeks. So I'm going to refer you back to the book. The book has all this information, but I'm going to bring in some supplemental steps so that I'm not just kind of repeating, regurgitating what the book says, but just different ways to think about it. Okay, so let's get going. All right, this first one, let's go back and think about motivation. The motivation, that which arouses, directs, and sustains behavior. It's, it's the want to able to want to make up performance both need to be present so we studied the want to dimension in a lot of different ways the need theories we studied reward theories um, just just a variety of different ways those motivational models but if we go back and look at this this is maslow and so you know the physiological needs down at the bottom the safety needs love and belongingness needs esteem needs and self-actualization so why do people join groups you know if you think about it from this perspective uh, from a motivation thing why would people want to join groups or why do they join groups one of those can be the fulfillment of needs so you know kind of as, as we're kind of educated in the ways of the world you know we've always heard that it's better to stay in groups for a lot of different reasons but it can bring about protection it can bring about shared work uh, you could divide up the labor and each have different responsibilities. But if you think about this from Maslow's perspective, that physiological needs, those, those kind of core things down at the bottom, if you work together in a group, you can, you can work together to fulfill those needs. Safety needs, that personal security, go out in big groups, you know, stay with other people. Safety needs, so being a part of a group can help fulfill safety needs. Love and belongingness. <laughs> Okay, you need someone else to, to belong and you need someone else to have that intimacy and friendship and love. So again, being part of a group, whether it just be two or a bigger group can also help fulfill those needs. Esteem needs, respect, self-esteem, status, recognition, strength, freedom. Those again can be, can be gained uh, from being a part of a group. Self-actualization, the desire to become the most that one can be. Being a part of a group can help us move toward those things and desire those things. So I'm starting this presentation, again, drawing on kind of motivation ideas. Why would people want to join groups? The want to, the fulfillment of needs. So just like we studied these concepts in the motivation area, they're also very applicable uh, in, in this study of groups. All right, so this is from a book. Uh, these are kind of common. So what I did in, in putting together this presentation this afternoon is I just kind of Googled, these are the ideas that I wanted to talk about. And I found other uh, slides. I've just borrowed these slides and I cited them. Uh, they, they covered the ideas that I wanted to. So this, this little list right here, uh, why do people join groups? Well, there's security. <laughs> Again, goes back to Maslow. Status, that, that is a group thing. So within a group, the one who's the newest is kind of maybe the lowest in the sense. The one who's been around has seniority, has accomplishments uh, that can have the higher status. So maybe some type of rank or prestige within the group. Self-esteem, again, going right back to Maslow. Affiliation, so that can be a McClellan step, that need for affiliation. Being a part of a group can help satisfy those needs. Also power is also one of McClellan's needs. So power is this interpersonal thing well, you need another person. So uh, those power needs can be achieved by being part of a group and also goal achievement. So we're gonna play with goal achievement. That, from the management perspective, that's kind of the one we think of probably the most is that more people can accomplish more in a lot of cases, in most cases, than a single individual, okay? So let's keep playing with it. Why do people join groups? So those are some reasons right there. Now, let's look at this goal achievement idea right here. So I need to make a distinction between physical tasks 
and mental task. And mental task is going to be uh, an upcoming slide, and then we'll, we'll pull in some other ideas. But with physical tasks, this is one of those ideas where you need just the right number, okay? Because so kind of like Goldilocks, um, you know, that bed's too hard or that bed's too hard. Well, this one's just right. The porridge is too hot or the porridge is too, well, this one's just right. If you have a physical task and you have too few people, it, it's going to be a problem. If you have too many people, it can also be a problem. So kind of one of my favorite examples, uh, actually two different times, I recall being uh, summoned, <laughs> kind of the, the call for help went out to help move pianos. And so one of them was a buddy he had inherited from a mother-in-law's house and it was down in their carport and they needed to get up into the house, which involved going up about uh, six or seven steps. And so uh, he invited some some friends over to help. It was our softball, some, some of our softball guys. Uh, when we got there, at first it was just it was just me and, and Tim. Uh, but then after a while, then another one showed up and another one showed up. And actually we were expecting one more. But then me be kind of the management guy, I started running numbers in my head. Well, do we really need to hang around and wait for this other Keith to show up? He may or may not. He seemed like he wasn't real certain when he said that he might. So, you know, if we had four people doing it, four people lifting a piano, we would each share about a quarter of the weight. If we waited for Keith, we would each share a fifth of the weight. So by waiting for Keith, we're each gaining just 5%. So at that point, we realized, nah, he may or may not show up. He eventually did show up, but it was after we <laughs> got things done. But but those percentages. So if you have to lift a piano by yourself, that's 100%. If you bring in a buddy, then you each carry 50%. So your reduction in what your load reduction, you went from 100% down to 50%. That's a 50% savings by bringing in this other person. When you go from two people, 50% down to three people, 33%, okay, you're, it's making your load lighter, but it's at a decreasing rate. So instead of 50% with two people, now you're at 33%, that's a 17% gain, okay? When you add that fourth person, now you're down to each just lifting a quarter, that's dropping it from 33% down to 25%, that's just an 8% gain. And then Keith would have dropped us down to 20% each, but from 25% at four down to 20% at five, that's just a 5% gain. So the more people you add, your load becomes lighter each time, but at a decreasing rate. So one of these issues, which is gonna come back later, but we're here, um, is, is an idea from economics and it's diminish, diminishing marginal productivity. As you add more people to the task, the, the amount that the next person helps with adds is it is little less than what the person before brought in. Okay, so diminishing marginal productivity. When do you stop adding people to the task? Well, you stop adding people using an economics concept when the benefit is equal to the cost. Okay, as, as long as that ratio is, is uh, different, then you add people, but all of a sudden when there's a intersection, when benefit and cost intersect, that's when you stop. Okay, so that's an economic reason for figuring out the right size. Too few people, it's really heavy. Too many people, okay, we're kind of in each other way. And there was another one. We were we were uh, at a church supper one night and the piano had to be moved, grand piano had to be moved from a pit where the piano was up onto the main stage. And so a call went out during the church supper and said, hey, <laughs> any able-bodied people who'd like to help move this piano, we would welcome you at whatever time out in the sanctuary. So. At the appointed time, a lot of people responded to that call, probably between 20 and 30. And the way I was positioned, I was at the very end. When they said go, everybody lift, it was out of control. There were too many people, it almost crushed me. I was able to jump kind of up out of the way and the guy next to me was able to get out of the way. But in that case, we finally just said, look, there are too many people involved in this task. Half of you go away, again, the benefits, that we were bringing in for all those extra people were so tiny. The piano must list, lifted itself uh, with all those hands on there. But again, the coordination, it was too many. I remember seeing a, a softball, like a city community, 4th of July softball event. And it's like the whole town, a little mountain town over in New Mexico. They had split into two teams. There were like 50 people in line waiting to bat and there were about 50 people in the outfield. 
that would be very hard to coordinate. A pop ball comes up, well, who's going to catch it? Well, if there are only three or four or five people in the outfield, that's easy to coordinate. But with 50 people and the ball coming to about five of them, that's, that's too much. Okay, so it's possible to have too many. It's also possible to have too few. We want to find that, that sweet spot where just the right number of people is. Okay, so economics kind of gives us a understanding and a model for figuring out when, <laughs> when to stop bringing in people. Uh, there's some other things that kind of pop up, and these are going to come back uh, later in the presentation as well. Uh, things to be challenges and things to be aware of. But social loafing, okay, so social loafing is one of these group level phenomena. This is one of our org behavior things. It's unique to the group. It's individuals doing it, but it's a group level phenomena. When we have individuals working together, there's a tendency for people to back off of what they would do by themselves in kind of the maximum way. So if you've ever been a part of a, a school group project where someone didn't pull their weight, but still expected the same grade as the ones who did work, that's social loafing. It's a tendency to back off and let other people carry the burden. Uh, one of the great studies that was done on social loafing had to do with pulling a rope. Okay, so I'm gonna kind of explain this using my own description. Imagine on the wall, that there was this plate that could measure how hard uh, the force was that was pulling on it, kind of like a scale in reverse, a pulling for, uh, force. Okay, so some kind of loop, a rope that pulls out from the wall, and they brought in individuals and said, pull on that thing as hard as you possibly can. So someone would get on the rope and they'd position themselves and pull and pull and pull until they're about to pass out, and then they got measured. So let's say I pulled 200 units. And then another person came in and they positioned themselves on the rope and they pulled and pulled and pulled and they could pull 300 units. Okay, so 200 for one person, 300 for the other person. What if you did both of them together? What would you expect? Would you expect 500, which is what they did individually summed? Would it be more than 500 or would it be less than 500? Okay, so before you answer that, let's think about that rope. So if you were to position yourself in the ideal situation, think about a tug of war, and you put the biggest, strongest person with most mass at the end, they wrap that rope around them. Everybody else then has to position themselves to the side in some way where they're pulling. That's a less than ideal position to be in. Okay, so when you did it by yourself, both of them could be in the ideal position. When you do it with a partner now, only one can be in the ideal position and one is in a less than ideal position. So right there, you're going to lose some of that power. Okay, because of just the way the, the rope is set up and kind of the task is defined. But what they found is that you put two people together pulling on the rope. They do not exceed what they could do, the sum of what they could do. They don't even reach what they could do summed. They couldn't do the 500. What happens is they end up doing less than 500. Part of it has to do with the being on the, uh, not being in the ideal optimal position on the rope, but also some of it has to do with social loafing. So I remember when I pulled that thing by myself, that was really uncomfortable. I was about to pass out. And so when I do this with my buddy, I'm gonna let my buddy carry some of that load and I'm gonna back off a little bit. My buddy might be thinking the same thing, even though my buddy might be in the ideal position. My buddy's not going to want to go because I'm there to help too. You know, so we might pull 480 together where our sum was 500. We're now at 480. So we're still way more than what an individual could do. An individual, the best individual could only do 300. Together, we're doing 480, but we're not exceeding what we could do summed. We're not in the 520 range. Okay, for that. Now, I'm going to put a little asterisk next to that. Okay, let's look at social facilitation. So social facilitation says that we perform differently in the presence of others than we do by ourselves. Perform differently in the presence of others than we do by ourselves. Now, sometimes this is one of those where it can enhance it or it could distract, distract the individual and could actually harm performance. So, uh, you know, I, I had that little karate school for a long time. There, there were some times where people were struggling and I'd go over and help them. And when they finally mastered it, I kind of pause everybody and said, hey, look at so-and-so. Let's have so-and-so demonstrate. And when so-and-so demonstrated and they nailed it, 
bam, that was awesome. Okay, what happened was motivation increased and because they knew everybody was watching, they tended to perform better, differently when you're confident in the task and particularly a physical task. Okay, with mental tasks, having people look at you can be distracting. Okay, so uh, when you're confident, being in front of other people can enhance performance because you know that you're confident and maybe this is your chance to show off. Maybe it goes back to your self-esteem, but if it's seen as distracting, I'm not real confident in this. I'm really kind of worried about doing it in front of everybody. And now I know that everybody's watching me and in my mind, they're evaluating me. That can be a distraction and can harm performance. So why do we see a lot of world records set at the Olympics? It's the biggest stage in the world, athletic stage in the world. People are confident, they've trained, they rise to the occasion and do exceptional things. Other people who are not as confident, and hey, this only comes along every four years. I've trained and trained and trained. I really hope I don't mess up. Ooh, and then they do mess up. Maybe it's too big of a distraction. These are <laughs> group level. They're individual things. Okay, I'm backing off of my performance or I'm doing better, but it's in the presence of others. It's a group level thing. So interesting, interesting. This is why we need to be educated on this. All right, so uh, goal achievement on physical test. Mental task. Uh, the first time I was ever exposed to this was in grad school. And, and one of my mentor teachers, uh, she, uh, it was back at the time where the Nintendo track and field game came out. And she had hooked it up to the big uh, projector and it was broadcast up in front of the intro to management class with 300 students in it. And so this particular day when she was talking about social facilitation, she brought in one of the uh, students from the university who was on the track and field team and brought her into the office and did the track and field where, where there's that pad and then you run on it and it measures how fast you're doing it. And so we got a base level of performance in the professor's office. And then about 20 minutes later, she got to do it again in front of the whole class. And she did much better in front of the whole class. Again, confident in her ability to do it. She was an NCAA Division I college level athlete. She was very confident. Now, the other person uh, in the professor's office was given a spelling list of really kind of strange words plucked out of the dictionary. And with that spelling list, okay, uh, was given 10 questions and then a score was noted. Now the person didn't know what the score was. And then 20 minutes later, uh, in class in front of 300 people was giving the spelling list again. And what happened was the, the uh, number of correctly spelled words dropped in the presence of others. Mental tasks uh, are different. Being around others, social facilitation uh, can, can uh, be distracting. Now, with mental tasks, we can have synergy. And synergy is where the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. So kind of different from what was just suggested with those physical tasks, where two people together probably could not lift more than the, what they could individually summed. With mental tasks, it, you might be able to do that. And so this is where having diversity within teams is critically important. So diversity of backgrounds, that you've experienced different things, you've been exposed to different things, you've paid attention to different things, and you filed those things away in your head. Those things in your head can then be referred to in the future to connect and combine in different ways to solve problems. So diversity of backgrounds is important, but also diversity of cognitive styles. Again, an individual level thing. So the way that I work, do I process, going back to those Myers-Briggs dimensions, the middle two dimensions, do I process in big chunks of information or little specific details? Once I get the information, am I more rational or am I more going with my gut? Is it more an intuition or is it that big picture? So those different cognitive styles, the way we gather information and then the way we process information, we want diversity within that. And then, okay, I'm kind of tapping into the ideas of brainstorming, which we'll come back to later. With brainstorming, everybody must contribute. So if we do have a lot of diversity, but only two people speak, then we don't really have a lot of diversity. It only works if everybody contributes. So kind of the way my brain sees those ideas of diversity and everybody contributes and we all have different backgrounds and ways of processing is like a Venn diagram. So I just I just grabbed this 
uh, as an example of a Venn diagram, looking at different color types. Uh, but really, you know, if you see the green, uh, let's say that's someone's past experiences. And then blue, maybe we grew up together or down the street or we're in the same college or we're working together in the same organization. We kind of grew up in the same place. We don't have identical experiences and ways. We're, we're slightly different, but there is overlap. So the yellow, the orange, the red, the blue, the green, we take all of those together and there's going to be overlap, but then there's also unique characteristics of each one of those. And we need that. We need that for these mental tasks. Okay, we'll come back to this at, at, toward the end of this presentation where we're talking about group problem solving and uh, brainstorming and those ideas and drawing upon your experiences and combining them. We'll come back to them. Okay, here's another one on why people join groups. And this has to do, go back to needs. So uh, just another one that I found. So there's affiliation needs, identification, survival needs, emotional support, assistance, or help. When you go hiking, <laughs> Uh, you always, it's good to have other people. When you go cycling, it's always good to have people in case something goes wrong. Uh, commonality. So this is going to be the different types of groups, which I'll show you here in a second. So there's something in common about us that brings us together. We can have a band with multiple people who are interested in having a band. It's hard to do that by yourself. Okay. So common goals. Um, maybe it has to do with fitness. Maybe it has to do with a lot of different travel. We like travel. And so we come together. Situational uh, reasons, so your proximity, that you're near each other, or uh, assignment, however that's defined. All right, so let's let's do this real quick. So different types of groups, and we're going to make a distinction here between uh, teams and groups in just a second. But these are work groups. So formal groups and informal groups. Formal groups are ones that have been put together by the organization. So within the formal groups, let's let's focus on those. Formal groups can put together within the organization. We have command groups. So those are going to be the ones whose positions, the ones who occupies those positions, come together and they make the decisions for the for the organization. Then the other is task groups. And these are people who are grouped together to accomplish something in particular. So at a university, we have a lot of committees, and those committees have a lot of different purposes. Some of them are standing committees, a permanent task group. Some of them are more ad hoc, where we come together and exist to solve this problem. And then once the problem is solved, then we're done. Okay, so those ideas, formal groups, organizational groups, ones that are defined uh, within the bylaws or, or ones that are appointed by the ones in charge, the command groups. Uh, task groups, again, come together to solve a particular thing, and they can be permanent and ongoing, or they could be temporary, more ad hoc. Then. We have other groups, we have informal groups, and these are groups that, that come together because of interest or friendships. So uh, I've, again, I've got friends, I've got family um, who have longtime friends and those friends get together on a regular basis and uh, maybe go shopping together or have a weekend together because they've been friends and they enjoy being around each other. Interest groups could be a lot of different things. So at, here at, at the university, uh, different sports clubs and different other student organizations. They get together because they're interested in something in particular. Okay, so different types of groups, just different ways to pull this apart. So when we just say groups, there are lots of reasons people join them, and then there are lots of different types of groups. All right. Now I got to I got to talk about this in order to kind of lead us into where we're going with this stuff. So this is Thompson and uh, Thompson's forms of interdependence. So if you go back to the definition of a, an organization, two or more people working together interdependently to accomplish a goal or set of goals, that same definition really applies for, for a group or a team. It's two or more interdependent people who work together to accomplish something in particular. Now, they're not all the same. So if you look at this, this is Thompson, and, and over there on the left, pooled sequential and reciprocal. These are kind of the three pure forms defined by Thompson. And then over on the right side of that table, you'll see that it ties back to technology. So that's what Thompson did with this. He said how organizations do their work and how things get done, the type of technology is really driven and influenced by their interdependence. So with the pooled interdependence. So it gives the example of a bank. Okay, so what a bank does is it connects people <laughs> This were my personal finance class or intro to business, we were talking about this. So a bank kind of stands in the middle of people who have excess capital and want to invest it safely. Uh, and then it connects it with people who need capital 
for productive opportunities. So it would be very inefficient if I had money that I wanted to invest to go out and start pounding on doors and start talking to people to see if they have any worthwhile uh, things that they could use it for that would provide me some type of return. That's very inefficient. So banks stand in the middle as kind of this intermediary where people who have access bring it to the bank. The bank then performs credit checks and credit worthiness of all of these people coming in with the ideas, and then it links the two. And so the, the ones who are bringing the money in, they get some type of interest or payment back. And then the ones who need to borrow the money for this productive opportunity, when it is productive, they're able to repay the bank with interest. <laughs> the bank then gives back some interest to the to the people who brought the money and then it keeps the difference between the rates given back and the rates charged. And that's how banks uh, make some of their money. So anyways, pooled interdependence. Uh, think about a, uh, a golf team, a golf team or a gymnastics team or a tennis team. So uh, think, think about that. Think about what is done at practice. Well, those are pretty much individual sports. So within this golf team at practice, the coach is going to work with the individual players on their strengths and weaknesses and come up with strategies and ways of helping develop each athlete individually. And then they go compete, think about a tennis team, then they go compete against this other team. And then at the end, the score is calculated by adding up the performances, all the performances together in some way. So uh, my son played on the tennis team all through middle school and high school, and they'd count up the number of matches won. If you think about a golf team, what they would do is they'd, they'd somehow add up the, in the scores of all the individuals to come up with a team score. Gymnastics, kind of the same way. They add up the individual scores to come up with the team score. As the coach, as the manager, what is your job? Your job is to work with your individual athletes on their particular games, and then get everything set, go to competition, and then and hope, dream uh, through your preparation that, that your scores, your team scores come out better than your opponent's scores. All right, individual. Uh, sequential, sequential, this is like a relay race, relay race. So a sequence, this is done first, and then it's handed off to this person, and then it's handed off to this next person. So in this one, they talk about a manufacturing plant, so raw materials come in on one side and then it's processed, processed. One is handed off to the next until the very end. Think about building a house. Okay, you can't put the roof on before you lay the foundation. There's a sequence to it. Things have to be done in a specific order. Think about a coach. Okay, so now you're working track and field and you literally have a relay team. And so what do you work on in practice? Well, you work on individual strengths for that particular role, but then you also have to work on that handoff. Okay, before one person has to finish their job and literally hand off the baton to the next person who runs. So practice, again, a lot of time spent on individual work, but then also time spent on that sequence. And once the first runner is done, first runner is done. And then, and then it takes the rest of the team to successfully hand that thing off and get around until the team is done. So the team is still, it's the individual performances added but it's a little more complicated that that transition between them is all complicated. Okay, so with this, again, uh, long linked technology is, is what Thompson talked about, where mediating technology was required for pooled. And then this last one is reciprocal. So one of the things I love about watching professional basketball, you know, high level college basketball, is, is just watching the teamwork. Hockey, I think, has a lot of this. Soccer uh, does too. Uh, reciprocal. I really think basketball, though, is kind of in my mind, kind of the pure form because you know, with with hockey and soccer, you have defensive people kind of stay in their positions for the most part. Basketball is this constant transition between offense and defense, and you're constantly switching ends and switching roles uh, at a moment's notice. So reciprocal. This is now interdependence where. Person A and person B and person C are all dependent on each other at the same time. So even as a racquetball player, uh, had some good doubles this week, 
a lot of that has to do with where is my partner? If my partner runs to the front, then I have to fill in. If my partner does this, then I have to do this. If I hit the ball in this particular place, it means these things. That's reciprocal interdependence, where everybody is dependent upon each other. What is time spent on in practice? Well, the individual skills, but then you also need a lot of time to develop that teamwork. And you know that when I make this pass, I'm gonna have this person waiting for, because they know us with everybody knows each other so well, and they understand the game and the system and how the team works. So in this one, uh, reciprocal interdependence, what Thompson linked it to is what he called intensive technology, such as uh, an emergency room. So if you think about an emergency room, someone comes in, you don't know what's wrong with them, but regardless of what's wrong with them, they have to put together the team to solve it sometimes very quickly. And so you have to be ready for whatever the situation brings you. All right, so this is Thompson, and this goes right back to groups and teams. You know, as the one in charge, these are your people. This is how they're organized. This is the stuff that they're doing. I have to understand how to train them and teach them and have them ready to compete or perform in whatever context is needed. All right, let's jump and, and see where I go with this. All right, so this next one is on uh, teams versus groups. Hmm, have you ever really thought about that? So if you think about a, uh, we, we were out on the road, we, we had to uh, travel down to Texas recently. And when we came back, there were a lot of people out uh, collecting trash. They were cleaning up the highways, it looked great. We saw uh, garbage bag after garbage bag on the service road, and we saw a bunch of people out there wearing a safety vest and several vehicles out there. It looked like you were gonna drive everybody back together. Okay, that was a group, that was a work group where everybody <laughs> had a bag and they had picker uppers and they had their gloves on and they had their vest on. Everybody was doing their part to come in and as a big group, make this place look beautiful and pick up all that trash very quickly a lot faster than what you could do as an individual, a group. So with a group, it's it's people with shared uh, a goal, shared goals, they wanna to come together, but everybody might be doing kind of the same thing, but just in, in their own way, kind of at the same time. A team, how do you know if you see a team? And a lot of times teams are gonna be distinguished sometimes by their uniforms, but after having spent a lot of years uh, playing baseball and softball, uh, Baseball and softball is very much one of these, I play a certain position <laughs> and I depend upon all my other teammates to play their positions well, and they depend upon me. So I played third base for a long time. And I knew that in each scenario, uh, when the batter got up there and the ball was gonna be put into play, if it was, what I needed to do at each particular scenario. So if it went out to the outfield, there was nobody on base, then I did this. If there are runners on base, then I did this. And everybody else on the team is thinking and doing the exact same thing. We all understand our roles in relation to all the other roles on the team. And if the ball, if we don't have a pitcher, you know, we can't all go out there and pitch. We, we have to have a pitcher and a catcher and a person in each position. That's different from a group in, in the way we define this. So again, group can be each person kind of doing their thing, and maybe we're all doing the same things, but it, collectively we can do a lot more than we could individually. A team is, we also have these different roles and we work together collectively, but we tend to have these specialized roles. And a lot of times the sense of identification uh, will be higher. A lot of sports teams, they wear the same uniform, so you know which team is which, okay? So within a work organization, a work context, a team is going to be one with a lot of interdependence. Um, if you think about a, a baseball team or a sports team, when the play is happening, you, <laughs> the players don't all look over to the dugout to look over to the manager to see what to do. Everybody knows what to do. They're all self-active. They're all taking part of leadership. Leadership is shared and distributed among all of the team players. Within the group, we still may look to the one in charge who organized all this to help kind of point us in the right direction to tell us what we need to do because everybody's kind of more equal in what we do. Interesting concepts. So teams and groups, organizations, interdependence, goals, roles and goals, organizations. 
All right, stages of group development. So this, again, one of those classic concepts. Uh, Tuckman and Jensen uh, did this. Form, storm, norm, and perform. And then later, adjourn was added because groups can be temporary groups. So those ad hoc committees. Uh, with, with my traditional classes where we do group projects, when the semester is over with, the project's over with. It was a temporary project. It adjourns. Uh, so to make it kind of rhyme, form, storm, norm, perform, and adjourn. But it can be an ongoing group as well or an organization, and it doesn't have to adjourn. It can keep reinventing itself and being relevant in the marketplace and keep going. So just as kind of human development, we have these very natural stages of, of growth from the time we're conceived until our bodies wear out, where we advance through these different stages of human development. Groups uh, kind of have a similar process style uh, life cycle as well. So forming, uh, I always point this out with, with my students when we have class, I'm gonna put them into groups. Right now, before I name them, they're just a bunch of individuals. But then after they find out who they get to work with, bam, now all of a sudden they're a group or a team. And so with this, that's the forming stage. So in that forming stage, what are we going to do? There's a lot of uncertainty. Uh, what exactly are we supposed to do? How are we going to organize ourselves? Who's going to be in charge? Ooh, what do we do? Storming stage. Now you start thinking about it. Storming stage is this. Well, we could do this. Well, I don't like that. Well, we could do that. Well, I have an idea. Well, who are you to have that idea? So in this storming stage, we have all this kind of uh, stuff up in the air where we're trying to figure out exactly what we're going to do. There may be some kind of uh, anxiety and stress and, and maybe some personality clashes uh, figuring out what we're going to do. Then after that, okay, now we say, here's what our group pro project's going to be. You know, we're going to make these socks uh, with the university logo on them and we're going to sell them, you know, for Christmas presents or whatever they may be. Uh, we're going to offer them through. Okay, once that's figured out, then the norming stage. So the norming stage norms these kind of unwritten rules of behavior. What does that mean? How are we going to, how are we going to do this? <laughs> so if we have a meeting at eight o'clock, does that mean at eight o'clock we are ready to go? Or does eight o'clock mean at 8.05 someone shows up with donuts and we sit around and talk for, okay, what, what does that mean? That's the norming stage where we actually come up with, here's exactly how we're going to do this. And then the performing stage is now we actually do it. So the performing, we're interdependent, we're organized, we're all put together, and we're moving toward our goals, and we're able to measure those. And then if we reach our goal and we're done, then we're adjourned. If, it's, if we've met our goal and now we have a new goal, or you know, here's our monthly goal, and then what are we going to do the next month? It can keep going. Okay, so stages of group development, just one of those classic uh, OB organization topics uh, as we study groups and teams. Now. Uh, I wanted to bring this up, and this has to do, again, groups, it's one of those levels. So individuals can learn through new mistakes. Okay, oh, I'm, that made, I made a mistake on that. I recognize it. I'm going to fix it the next time. I didn't like messing up. I'm going to fix it. I'm going to learn. I'm going to bring in new knowledge. I'm going to combine it in different ways. Groups and organizations can do the same thing. So I just found these two little slides. Uh, that first one up there, organizational learning and Knowledge management is what the KM. So just to show you that individuals can have individual learning and relates back to personal knowledge, teams, groups can do the same thing. So you watch sports teams. Ooh, that was a really bad performance. Learn from it. Okay, what can we do to fix it? So the next time we, we don't have that. And then organizations can learn as well. So through knowledge, through things that they've acquired, there needs to be a process for kind of recording that knowledge and then as people come and go within organizations, that it's passed along to people who come in uh, later and fulfill those roles. So you're not making the same old mistakes over and over again. You're learning, you're making new mistakes as you go forward. Okay, so with this innovation, innovative teams, learning teams, learning organizations, it all goes back, it's the culture. If the organization has to be set up and say, we are here to purposefully improve and to get better and to innovate. That needs to come down from leadership at the top. It needs to be part of the systems. It needs to be part of the, the culture and kind of the ethos of, of what it is that the organization stands for, that we are here to learn and improve and innovate. It has to be built into the system, but it can be. It can be just like individuals can learn. So can groups and so can groups of groups within organizations. So really good ideas. Uh, if you wanna explore them further, 
jump on out and uh, there's just a lot of good material on this. All right, next one is cohesiveness. Now this is again, one of those group level concepts. So individuals, we have individual concepts, groups, we have group level concepts. You put individuals together into a group, you form them into a group, you have to have something that kind of glues them together. All right, so these are some of those things. I, I just, again, some that I found uh, online that, that kind of tapped into exactly what I want to talk about. As you're looking at that, let me give you a little story. So uh, if we were live, if we were all together, I'd probably find one of you who had a water bottle or some type of water bottle, and it looked like it was about empty. And so I would ask you to finish it and then ask if I, if I could use it for class to show them something. So let's pretend like it's you. So you finish your water bottle, you suck it all out, and then I have you turn it over and show that there's there's no more in there. And so then you'd give it to me. And as I'm talking, what I would do is I would shake that water bottle. And then when the appropriate time came, I would then say, well, look, and I turn it over and more water would dribble out. What's happening? Well, it's the adhesion and cohesion. It's these two different forces. So adhesion to adhere, okay, to adhere. And then cohesion is stick together. So adhesive tape, we use tape to stick one thing to another thing to adhere. So water, little water droplets will adhere to the side of the water bottle. And then when I force them down together, then they will pull up and then cohesion, the forces that keep them together will be stronger than what was sticking them to the side of the bottle. And then when I poured them out, they would then cohesion would keep all the little molecules together and they would come out as more water. And we could really do that a couple of times. So cohesion are those forces that keep like things together. Adhesion, we tend to think of different things. Cohesion within an organization are the forces that keep individuals together and functioning as a group or functioning as a team. So if you look at those things around that circle right there, those are some of the things that keep people identified as a group or as a team. You have to have something or else they just kind of float away, they just kind of dissipate and evaporate away. When they're together, they can do special things. Now, with this being too cohesive can be a problem. So almost kind of the Goldilocks. We need some cohesion, but not too much cohesion. So these are some uh, again, this, this is from an old book that I used way back when I first started teaching, and it's just kind of always stuck with me. So group think is the tendency for the group to develop its own mind and kind of the individuals who make up that group to kind of not use their minds anymore. <laughs> okay, the group is, is the thing that, that thinks, and the individuals, sometimes when they don't agree with it, they're afraid to speak up because they don't want to be seen as, as a bad member of the group. So sometimes they'll go along with the group. Maybe they didn't want to um, because they, they don't want to rock the boat. They don't want to create conflict, which is, again, one of our topics uh, for, this, for, for this talk, this lesson. Overbounding. So I, when I learned this one uh, back in grad school when I, when I was teaching, for some reason, magic shell came to mind. So if you think about magical shell, that wonderful, wonderfully delicious chocolate topping that you put on ice cream, when you pour it on the ice cream, it's in liquid state, but then it hits that cold and it becomes hard and it creates a shell around the ice cream. Overbounding to me, that's always what kind of stuck in my mind. When groups become so cohesive that they don't want to hear anything from the outside, they just want to operate and do it what they've always done, that sometimes that almost kind of uh, creates a protective barrier around them and they lose touch with the outside world. So the outside world can completely change, but because they're so isolated and insulated from that, they're totally unaware of that. And maybe if someone does crack through, they realize, oh my goodness, everybody's gone. <laughs> everybody's left. We're totally in the wrong place. Okay, another, that's another problem with being too cohesive. And then this one, I think it was because about the time the book was written, this has to do with Oliver North and the Iran-Contra uh, eventually faced trial. This is the tendency to do unethical or illegal things for the good of the group. <laughs> this benefits the group, but it's unethical and or illegal, but because it benefits the group, I'm gonna do it. 
when, when you shouldn't have done that in the first place. Another problem with becoming too cohesive. Okay, so those are three of them right there. Now, some of these other issues that are also related to cohesion. Uh, devil's advocate, if you've ever heard that expression, which I think most of us have. Devil's advocate, well, here, let me do the next one first. Uh, A-type and C-type conflict. So this one, I remember getting ready for my comprehensive exams in grad school and ran across an article that was written and it had to, it had to do with the paradox of conflict. Mm -hmm. Paradox, it's this and it's this, which seem to be opposing. How can conflict be good in certain instances for an organization? How can conflict also be bad? <laughs> conflict is good, conflict is bad. And so the author of this article uh, when it said, well, it actually, conflict's not all the same. They're actually different types of conflict. Some of that tends to be related to the bad, destructive conflict. Other types of conflict tend to be related to better uh, conflict. So A type, affective, and we've brought this up before, that affective, that's the emotions. Uh, when we talked about attitudes, we talked about affective, behavioral, and cognitive dimensions of an attitude. And one of them, the affective is, is your feelings, your emotions, the uh, behavioral is what you do, and the cognitive is what you think. Affective is this emotional conflict. It tends to be interpersonal conflict, and it's emotion-based, and this person is really, I'm just fed up with this person, and when they open their mouth, I snap, and I jump all over them. If that happens in a work context, that's going to create hard feelings. There's going to be mistrust. They're probably not going to open their mouths again, and they're not going to ask for your input. That's the type of conflict that is tend to be bad, re result in, in bad, uh, ineffective uh, performance. C-type conflict, this is cognitive. This is issue-based. It's task-based. So let's get in there and really analyze the issue and really think through it in a lot of different ways. Now, group think, group thinks sometimes says, nope, the group said this, this is what we're going to do. Everybody's going to go along with it. C-type conflict would be someone stepping back and say, hey, one more time, explain to me why alternative A is superior to alternative B. Just help clear that in my head one more time. Okay, devil's advocates, that's what they do. Devil's advocates are ones who challenge the group to stay focused and to explain. <laughs> Cognitive conflict, don't let it be effective. Cognitive, explain to me one more time. Okay, it looks like we're all going along this path, but one, help me one more time to, to remember what the benefits are of this and how the benefits are better. If you've ever watched 12 Angry Men with, with uh, Henry Fonda way back in the whatever 50s or 60s, classic case in overcoming groupthink and the devil's advocate, the ones who wants to question before we step into that solution. Let's just go over it one more time, if you could, for me. Now, it may create conflict, okay? But, but it tends to result in, in better outcomes. So some classic research on devil's advocates, they, they studied groups that had devil's advocates and studied groups that did not have devil's advocates. And they found that those that do have devil's advocates tend to outperform those that don't. But then research also went back in and allowed those same groups. Now, if you could throw someone out, would you and who would it be? Kind of the, the consensus was, yeah, we would, and we would throw at that person who's the troublemaker who makes us think of this. We don't like conflict, but conflict can be that thing that leads to better outcomes. And then lastly, because I lived in Abilene, Texas for 22 years, uh, the Abilene paradox is also one of these. Uh, it's a group thing where the story is that this family was down in Coleman, Texas. They were kind of bored on a Saturday afternoon. And so, hey, well, why don't we drive to Abilene and go eat at this restaurant? And everybody's like, all right, let's 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 do it. And they all get in the car and they drive all the way up. Food's not that great. They got to drive all the way back, hot, unair conditioned car. And when they get back that evening, it kind of comes up. Well, you know, I really would have been fine just staying at home. But I went because I thought you wanted to go. Well, it turns out that no one in the group actually wanted to go, but they went because they thought everybody else did. That's group think. And sometimes it involves just someone stepping up and saying, eh, how about something else? And you'll find that within groups. Hey, why don't we all go eat at this place? Well, I just kind of ate there. Can, can we do something else? Oh yeah, we could do something else. You'll find that groups a lot of times are agreeable uh, if someone just kind of raises that. So devil's advocate, affective conflict, cognitive conflict, the Abilene paradox, cohesion, 
uh, conflict, all of these things are related, and there and there are things that arise within groups. All right, now decision making. Okay, decision making. So uh, if we were together, we would spend a whole day doing this. This is the lost on the moon exercise. And so I would get everybody uh, break y'all up, have you sit away from each other, give the directions that here's here's this scenario that you've got. You need to rank order these things, give them the directions. You can't use the phone, you can't look up extra information, you can't talk to anybody, just solve it based on the information in your head. And so they come up with a rank order and then I put them into groups and then the group has to work together and I make sure that everybody contributes. And if I hear one group or see someone that's not participating, I will go over there and get on. They have the, the Venn diagram. They have to come together and come up with a rank now as a group. And then when that's over with, we compare the average individual score to the group score and almost every time almost every time nine out of ten times the group score is better than the average individual score okay going back to the rope this is the two people together now pull more than 500 pounds that's the mental task it's the diverse backgrounds the diverse ways of thinking about things and coming together and working together Everybody contributing, everybody thinking through it in a task-based, problem-based, cognitive-based uh, method, the, the groups outperform the sum of the individuals. That is synergy, okay? Mental task, groups. All right, now we're kind of heading into the end. I see how long I've been going. Uh, problem solving. So that is a problem solving exercise. Uh, it's a mental task. But if you look at that kind of circly looking thing, this is your typical problem solving process. But I included this one. It's a little different because it involves step number two, which is one of these group topics that I wanted to bring up. Okay, so with any problem solving process, you have to define the problem. You have to come up with some alternative solutions. Then at some point you have to pick one of those solutions and then you implement it and then you follow up. That's your typical a uh, problem solving process that you'll see. We can talk about rational problems. We can talk about creative problems. Now, brainstorming is a idea generation and alternative solution generating technique. So we get the group to come together, we define the problem, and then we push them to think beyond the ordinary. So they're gonna come up with a big long list, huge list of possibilities. And then from that list, that's all they're doing is they're just generating possibilities. On the next slide, I'll show you some stuff. Uh, kind of a fun little example that, that I would do with my students when we practice this stuff is I would have them, I would, I would name something. So a dog. Okay, so let's all start with dog. Now, what does a dog make you think of? Okay, well, in my mind, so I'd have everybody do this. What does a dog make you think of? Now we're all starting to spin off in different directions. I'm thinking of a sheep dog. All right, so now I'm thinking of sheep, and I don't know where you are. And they say, now what does sheep make you think of? So everybody now takes another step away from that. So I'm I'm in Ireland. Okay, we we spent a sabbatical in Ireland, uh, and then and then what does Ireland make you think of? Well, it makes me think of whatever leprechauns. Okay, so I went from dog to leprechaun in just a couple of steps. You all started with dog and you went in different directions. One of my things when I have them brainstorm is I say, let's practice this. Someone throws out an idea on the board for whatever this problem is. You can, you can give us your idea to also put on board. You can go one level out from it. You can go two levels out for it. Or probably what's even more interesting is go three levels out. So this thing, this solution, alternative possibility, now I'm three levels away from it. Let's talk, let's think about that. And then if everybody does that throughout the group, you can end up in all kinds of interesting places. You're, everybody's kind of tapping into this collective brain now, collective experiences and ideas that you can draw upon now to connect in different ways to come up with a really unique uh, solution to this problem. So typical process right there. Here's some brainstorming, just a little, another little thing that I found. And now let's look at this. So this is IDEO and IDEO, uh, one of my hero organizations. I, I kind of found them uh, 1999. They were featured on a thing uh, before the turn of the century. Uh, they, they kind of take the traditional ideas of brainstorming. Brainstorming is an official technique. 
but it's based on these ideas. So when you come up, you're coming up with ideas. You're not coming up with, you're not selecting one. You're just coming up with the ideas. Can they be illegal? Can they be unethical? Well, at this stage, you just throw anything out there. <laughs> not that that's going to be the solution, but by throwing that thing out there, it can get others to think of interesting things. So you don't judge. You just say something and you write it down. Encourage wild ideas. That's that connecting out to different levels. Build on the ideas of others. So, hmm, I'm kind of out of idea. Oh, but you just said this. Wow, that made me think of this. Okay, uh, stay focused. So a lot of people want to kind of explain and talk. No, you got to stay focused. One conversation at a time. Don't be talking on top of each other. Be visual. Write these things down so you can come back later. And then quantity. You want a lot of different ideas. And then when time is up, then you stop. And then you go back and look at this big list. And you find those things that are unethical and you scratch them off. Those things are illegal. You throw them out. And then you start to evaluate them at that point. Okay, that's when you start judging them, combining them in interesting ways to come up with unique novel situation, uh, solutions to this problem. Creative problem solving, brainstorming. It's a group thing. <laughs> uh, the our, our book says you can do it by yourself, you can, but not to the extent that you could with groups of five to seven people. Fewer than five, too small. More than seven, you're playing softball with too many people. All right, some of these other things that are uh, mentioned, uh, some of these other topics, uh, consent, so these are uh, idea generation techniques, and you can look these up. One of them is called the consensus approach. One of them is called multi-voting, uh, where you come up with ideas, and then they have the ability to vote on these different things. Nominal group technique is, again, one of these coming up with uh, different alternative solutions, and then being able to compare and pass around and, and getting kind of everybody's different ideas and viewpoints. And then the stepladder approach. Some of these other things, techniques that are above and beyond brainstorming. All right, uh, kind of winding this down now. So some of these challenges of, of working with others, social loafing, we already brought that up. The tendency for individuals within the team to back off of ideal performance because the other ones are filling in form. How to keep everybody running at full speed. Uh, virtual teams, we're in this interesting new world, like what I'm doing right now. We can record things, we can communicate across great distances in real time at practically zero cost. We can have people uh, dispersed out and working together on projects and things permanent or temporary. Um, uh, probably mental task, uh, physical task would be a little harder to do when we're removed from each other, uh, but, but these mental tasks, uh, virtual teams, kind of cool ideas and topics that are now an issue uh, that, that, that we need to take advantage of. Uh, managing universe, uh, unifying diversity. So that's kind of how I pull them together. We want diversity, but with diversity, we need people who are competent and able to bring them together and manage that and be able to tap into the power of the diversity. And then team empowerment, again, going back to the baseball team. For the team to work best, the individual players have to know their roles. And when the, when the ball is hit to them, they have to know what to do. Or when the ball is hit to a teammate, they have to know what to do. They can't look over for direction. They have to go into action themselves. Okay, so uh, this last little bit, conflict and performance, we need a certain amount of conflict. We also see this with stress. Too little conflict, not very good performance. Too much, it can be distracting and harmful. So we wanna be able to manage conflict. We don't wanna avoid it, get rid of it. Again, devil's advocate, but we also don't want it to just destroy the organization either. Uh, conflict modes, okay, so I already brought this up in something earlier, uh, but these are the conflict resolution strategies. So cooperativeness and assertiveness, uh, it's kind of drawn opposite from how I did it before, but competing, no, oh, that's the same way I did it before. Competing is what I called forcing and accommodating is kind of the opposite. Compromise there is in the middle. Those are the distributive solutions. They're the, the zero sum. Every bite of cookie I get is one less bite that you get. Where collaborating is the integrative solution. We take your ideas, we take my ideas, and we put them together. We integrate them in a very creative, out of the ordinary possibly a way to come up with something that satisfies both parties. And then avoiding, not, not the recommended strategy, but sometimes avoiding and just kind of setting it aside, uh, things will resolve themselves. All right, very last, now this is the last. Okay, so with Hofstede, 
uh, one of these things about groups and teams and organizations is we must understand cultural elements. So this is Gert Hofstede stuff. And uh, actually, I know that this appears uh, at a different place in our book. And so I'm going to kind of save this for now. And uh, we will come back to it when we get to the global chapter and some of these bigger issues. So with that, again, a lot of stuff. Like I said, if this were a normal class, uh, in-person class, this would probably be a week and a half worth of material. Uh, but I was able to get through it in about an hour. So that's it for now. Thanks. Bye.